every person in our world is heading toward eternal life or eternal death. Bible prophecy tells us we are living in the last days of Earth's history when every person's eternal destiny is to be decided. The purpose of Steps to Life Television is to help you make the decisions you must make if your destiny is to be eternal life. Bible expositors all over the world have made many predictions about the 70th week of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. It is well known that these 70 weeks are 70 weeks of years or 490 years. But what is the basis of the belief that there is a 2000 year gap between the 69th and the 70th week? We're going to look at this today. Before we do that, let's pray that the Lord will help us to understand what we will read from his holy book. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for a Bible prophecy. We thank you for the Bible prophecies, especially that tell us about Jesus and about his work and about what he is going to do for his children who are faithful to him. And we pray that you will teach us the truth about these things now as we study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's free book is entitled, The Secret Rapture. To receive your copy, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer TSR. Many Christians today believe in the doctrine of the rapture. According to this view, the coming of Jesus will be in two separate events. To receive your free copy of The Secret Rapture, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer TSR. And now, Pastor John Grosball. During the first generations, the first 10 generations in this world after the fall of Adam and Eve, the human race rejected the law of God. They refused to live according to the laws or government of God. And what was the result? We read in Genesis, the sixth chapter, what happened. It says, starting in verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. It says in verse 11 of that same chapter that the earth was filled with violence. We live in a violent world today. Have you ever thought what would happen if everybody in the world started to keep the Ten Commandments? The wars would cease. The crime would cease. All kinds of trouble would instantly be gone if people in this world today decided to keep the law of God because the world almost universally was disobedient. The Lord said, they're going to have to be destroyed. I, I, can't, I cannot tolerate this anymore. There is too much human suffering. And so we read in Genesis 7, Concerning the flood, it says, All flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he, that is God, destroyed all living things, which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping things and bird of the air, they were destroyed from the earth, only Noah and those who were made, who were with him on the ark, survived. Incidentally, before we go on, I might just read to you what Jesus said about this. Jesus had quite a bit to say about the flood. Here's one of his comments about the flood. In Matthew 24, he said, As the days of Noah were, 
so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know, until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Notice, Noah told them there was a flood coming. The Lord told them they had 120 years left. But they didn't believe. They didn't believe Noah. They didn't believe the Lord would destroy the world in the flood. They had scientists in those days and philosophers, and they said, there's not enough water in the whole world to cover the earth, to have a worldwide flood. There's not enough water. The reason they didn't know that there was enough water was when God created the earth, you can read in the first chapters of Genesis, he had made an automatic watering system for the earth. At night, a dew came up from the ground. In the morning, the plants had water from this dew during the night, and so they didn't, they didn't need any rain. It was an automatic watering system that never involved bad weather. But when the flood came, that was destroyed. It says the fountains of the deep were broken up. And water shot up out of the deep. That's where we get our oceans and great bodies of waters from today. This automatic watering system that God had all over the earth. That was underground. That nobody knew existed. The extent of it. So after the flood, there was only eight people left in the world. We, we have today evidence of Noah's Ark in the land of Turkey, in the Mount Ararat. You can actually, people can go and see the remains of Noah's Ark today. But after the flood, amazingly, within a few generations, you see the same thing happening as happened before the flood. So that second ten generations of the earth, they rejected the law of God too. They rejected the government of the King of Heaven. Decided to go in their own ways, have their own religion, have their own laws. If you talk to people today about the efforts to change God's law, some will say, well, oh, we, we don't, we don't have to change it. We just adjusted it. Let me tell you, friends, what God does doesn't need to be adjusted. When God says he's given a law and he's not going to change it, as you can read in Psalm 89, God means just what he says. In fact, one of the most difficult lessons for human beings to learn is that God means just what he says. The people before the flood didn't believe it. They said God's too loving to destroy the whole earth that he made. But when God says he's going to do something, it's going to happen, friends. And the fact that human beings don't believe it won't hinder it coming to pass at all. It didn't stop the flood from happening. And in the 20th generation after creation, okay, there had been 10 generations before the flood. Now there are 10 generations after the flood. And in the 20, by the 20th generations, the world had rejected the laws and the government of God again. And so, God said, that he was going to effect, bring to pass, the plan of salvation so that some people from this world could be saved. He was going to bring to pass the plan of salvation through one man. Here's what God said. This is in Genesis, the 12th chapter. Genesis, the 12th chapter. We'll read verses 2 and 3. God here is speaking to a man by the name of Abram who later he changed his name to Abraham. His, God said to him, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you know why God made this promise to Abraham? Do you know what it was about Abraham that made him different than everybody else all around? 
so that God made him a promise. He said, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a blessing. And in you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Do you know why? We're going to read it right now. In Genesis 26. Now, in this passage of Scripture, God is speaking to Abraham's son, Isaac. And he repeats the same promise. This is what he says to Isaac. I will be with you and bless you, for to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and to your seed, all, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because, here's the reason, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. What was different about Abraham than everybody else? He was obedient. God said, he obeyed my voice. He kept my statutes. He kept my charge. He kept my commandments. He, my statutes, my laws. He, he kept whatever I said, he did it. If I said not to do it, he didn't do it. It's interesting in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says that only those who have faith are the children of Abraham. What does it mean to have faith? Well, it means you live like Abraham did. Abraham, when God said something, if you have faith, you do what he says. It wasn't like everybody else. God said this, and the people said, well, I'll do something else. I'll do whatever I want. The grandson of Abraham was Jacob. And after his conversion, the Lord changed Jacob's name to Israel. Here's how that happened. In Genesis 32. This is when Jacob thought his life was in danger and his whole family would get killed. It says, Genesis 32, starting with verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall be no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Jacob called the name of that place Peniel because he says, I have seen the face of God. And my life is preserved. I have seen God face to face, and so my life is preserved. So the name Israel was applied to a man, Jacob. His name was changed when he was converted. When he quit being a deceiver, like he had been. Now, this name that was given to a single man was later applied to all of his children. For example, if you look in the book of Exodus, the fourth chapter, and verses 22 and 23, this is what it says. This is what God told Moses to say to Pharaoh. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn, so I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Notice, the Lord called the descendants of Jacob, the descendants of Israel. He called all of them Israel. He said, they're my firstborn. That, you find that same thing repeated over and over again. 
throughout the Old Testament. For example, if you look in the book of Isaiah, chapter 41, Isaiah 41, you see here it says in verse 8, But you, Israel, are my servant, talking to the nation, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. So, the descendants of Jacob, the descendants of Israel, were also called Israel. The nation was called Israel. They became God's chosen people. Because what you read here in Exodus 19, this is what the Lord told them when they came out of Egypt. He said, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I have borne you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. That was a promise given to them that they would be a special people. They would be God's chosen special people, a special treasure above all nations in the world. They would be blessed above all nations. The nation of Israel, however, went into apostasy over and over again. When that happened, God sent them messages of warning to repent and turn through the prophets. Unfortunately, it did not work. Notice what is recorded here in Second Chronicles 36. Now, this is about the captivity, the Babylonian captivity that the children of Israel went through because of their repeated apostasy. They're repeating they're, they're, over and over again. They fell back into idolatry, breaking the law of God instead of keeping it. Here's what it says. Had the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. And all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and the, of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. But at the end of that 70 years, God promised them he was going to give them another chance. Stay tuned, we'll look at that. Bible prophecy has accurately predicted the future of churches and nations, hundreds and thousands of years in advance. Bible prophecy is the only dependable guide to what is really going to happen in the future and how to get ready for it. The Steps to Life Bible Correspondence Course lessons will help you understand Bible prophecy and Bible teaching about how you can be ready for the future. These lessons can be sent to your home without cost to you, or you can study the lessons online. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH to enroll or log on to our website at www.stepstolife.org. Welcome back. While the children of Israel were still in the Babylonian captivity, God told them through Daniel the prophet that he was going to give them 70 weeks more of probation. Let's just read that. In Daniel the ninth chapter, it says, this is what angel, the angel Gabriel says to Daniel, 70 weeks are cut off for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression. They were going to have 70 weeks more of probation. And before that 70 weeks would be over, and at the end of the 69th week, the Messiah would appear, as you can read in Daniel 9.25. The Messiah is the subject of the 70-week prophecy. 
The Messiah was going to confirm the covenant during the 70th week. And in the middle of the 70th week, the Messiah would cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease. How did Jesus do this? Look at what the Apostle Paul says about it in Hebrews 10. He says, It was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Verse 11, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Verse 14, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. In the Old Covenant you had many animal sacrifices that prefigured the true sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary. But in the New Covenant, Paul says over and over again in Hebrews 10, there's only one sacrifice. Jesus will never have to be crucified again. One time only will suffice. In the New Covenant, there is only one sacrifice, and so by his dying on the cross, Jesus brought to an end all the system of animal sacrifices. The 70 weeks extend from the time of the Persian Empire until the time of Christ. There is no gap of of 2,000 years between the 69th and the 70th week. Daniel 9.27 says nothing about a seven-year period of tribulation or about any Antichrist. Jesus, when he was talking about this prophecy, he applied the overspreading of abominations to the time when his followers would have to flee. Let's read that in the New Testament. In Matthew 24, verse 15, this is what Jesus said. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoso reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Jesus applied the overspreading of abominations to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Notice what he says about the same thing in Luke 21. Luke 21, verse, starting with verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So, Jesus said, by the way, the last time that he walked out of the temple at Jerusalem, the last time he walked out, you can read it in Matthew twenty-three thirty-eight. Jesus said, your house is left to you desolate. That's the desolation spoken of in Daniel 9, 24, 26, and 27. Your house, Jesus said, is left to you desolate. His presence would never more sanctify that building. When Jesus died on the cross, at the very moment that he died on the cross, you can read it in Matthew 27, 50, 51, 52. At the very moment that Jesus died on the cross, an on he seen hand tore the veil of the temple from top to bottom. And by the way, that curtain was not like the curtains we have on our windows today. It was a thick, heavy cat tapestry. It would have taken a Samson to tear it apart. God made it evident at that time that that building was not a sanctified place for his worship with animal sacrifices anymore because the true sacrifice for all time had been offered. No more sacrifices were needed. The system of animal sacrifices and offerings was brought to an end by Jesus' death on the cross. And Gabriel, remember, Gabriel said, the angel, when he talked to Daniel, he said that the 70-week prophecy applied specifically to the Jewish people. Notice what he said, Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are cut off for your people and for your holy city. The 70 weeks applied specifically to the Jewish people. From A.D. 27 to A.D. 34. 
During that time, the disciples of Christ did not go to the Gentiles. They went to the Jews. Read it in Matthew 10, 6. Jesus said, don't go to the Gentiles. You go to the Jews first. But after 34 AD, when Stephen was stoned, then the gospel began to go to the Gentiles. And you can read about it. Paul said, I've been appointed now as an apostle to the Gentiles in Romans 11. Peter began to preach and teach the Gentiles. The Lord sent him to Cornelius. You can read about that in Acts 10. And when the Jews rejected the gospel, the apostle Paul said to them, it was necessary for the gospel, the plan of salvation, to be explained to you first. But since you've rejected it, we're going to the Gentiles. We can, you can read that in Acts 13, 46. So what do we have to conclude from this? The entire seven-year period of great tribulation is a grand delusion. It may go down in history as the biggest evangelical misinterpretation of the 20th century. It can be compared, says one author, to a big, fat, hot air balloon. Inside, there is no substance but air. As soon as Daniel 9.27 is understood correctly, and the pin of truth is inserted, the balloon will pop. The fact is, no text in the Bible teaches any seven-year period of great tribulation. If you look for it, you will end up like Ponce de Leon, who tirelessly searched for the famous fountain of youth, but never found it. The current debate and tremendous confusion over pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation is a smokescreen of the enemy which is hiding the real issue. What is the real issue? We will find out what the real issue is in future programs when we study from the book of Revelation, the real issue of salvation. We all face one of two different destinies, eternal life or eternal death. We want to help you take the necessary steps so that your destiny will be eternal life. We worship the God who created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the Sabbath. You're invited to worship with us every Sabbath at 11 a.m. Central Time at our chapel at 9330 East Prairie Meadows Circle, Derby, Kansas on Webb Road, one half mile south of 47th Street or online at www.stepstolife.org. We hope you've enjoyed today's program. Today's free book is entitled the Secret Rapture. To receive your copy, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer TSR. Many Christians today believe in the doctrine of the rapture. According to this view, the advent of Jesus will be in two separate events. First, he will come secretly to take his church to heaven, and then, seven years later, he will come in the full demonstration of his glory. But the truth is that the Bible nowhere speaks of these two separate comings of Jesus. What does the Bible really teach will happen at the end of the world? To receive your copy of The Secret Rapture, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer TSR. From all of us here at Steps to Life Ministries, may God richly bless you as you seek for His truth. We hope you are choosing life as your eternal destiny. Steps to Life exists to help people choose life instead of death. We would love to hear from you. You can join us for worship on Saturdays at 11 a.m. Central Time at 9330 East Prairie Meadows Circle, Derby, Kansas, or write to Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782-828, Wichita, Kansas 67278, or call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Or email us at historic at stepstolife.org. Our web address is www.stepstolife.org. 